We continue our podcast this morning of the Prophetic Writing Series, We're dealing with the book The Beginnings, and our subject today is the Tower of Babel incident. We see uh, when the Israelites were in captivity and they came through to Babylon, uh, we saw previously how that Ezra stated that the Torah was burnt during the captivity and that uh, they undertook to rewrite their accounts and they wanted to show everything that happened from the beginning. And we've shown that they wanted to show perceived world history, which, were, which they believed at that time to be the case. But, of course, there are many issues uh, with these accounts. And one of them was the Tower of Babel incident and the separation of peoples. And um, we see this, this existed in various myths at that stage, and we're going to read a few of them this morning. And they were myths that were outside of the biblical account. They weren't part of the biblical account, but they related to what was believed uh, that, that occurred in that part of the world, in Mesopotamia. One of these, uh, some of these are, 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 are uh, depicted in Corey's ancient fragments, and, and the one is the... Uh, the uh, Sibylline, uh, Sibylline oracle about this, and as stated by Alexander Polyhister, the first one, and he says as follows, The Sibyl says that when all men formerly spoke the same language, some among them undertook to, erige, uh, to erect a large and lofty tower that they might climb up into heaven. But God, uh, sending uh, forth a whirlwind, confounded their design and gave to each tribe a particular language of its own, which is the reason uh, that the name of that city is Babylon. And after the deluge lived Titan and Prometheus, when Titan undertook a war against Cronus. So we see they related this, uh, this, this incident to the Titan wars and various things like that. And another, another section in, uh, in the ancient fragments uh, also states the Sibylline oracle and it's slightly different in this this uh, account let's read this but when the judgments of the almighty god were ripe for execution when the tower rose to the skies upon a Syria's plain so we see that this definitely arose in that assyrian area that area of mesopotamia and all mankind one language only knew a dread commission from on high was given to the foul whirlwinds uh, which the dire alarms beat on the tower, and to its lowest base shook, it convulsed, and now all intercourse uh, by some occult and overruling power ceased among men. By utterances they strove, perplexed and anxious, to disclose their mind. But their lip failed them, and in lieu of words produced a painful babbling, a babbling sound. The place was then called Babel. And so we see that particular uh, count there. And uh, Barosus also speaks of this, and, and Barosus says, They say that the first inhabitants of the earth, glorying in their own strength and size and despising the gods, undertook to raise a tower whose tops uh, should reach the sky in the place in which Babylon now stands. But when it approached the heavens, the winds assisted the gods and overthrew the work upon its contrivers, and its ruins are said to be still at Babylon. And the gods introduced the diversity of tongues among men, who till that time had all spoken the same language, and a war arose between Cronus and Titan. So we see that there were various myths of this particular incident, and we see that the Israelites uh, regarded this as, as perceived world history and wanted to uh, reflect this in their, in their biblical account. So in, in some of these accounts, it seems to indicate there was a wind and it uh, destroyed the tower to a degree. Now, we, we're going to discuss the various elements of this particular, uh, particular myth. And um, it actually uh, uh, relates back to, to Naram Sin. And, and this tower, who's, who's, who's uh, the summit of the tower that reached the stars and the moon, now, um, Naram Sin was the grandchild of Sargon the Great, and he lived between 2254 and 2218 BC. And he extended the, uh, the empire that Sargon uh, first, uh, first um, established. And we see that his name, uh, Naram Sin, and Naram means beloved, and Sin is the moon god Sin. And um, we see that the, the biblical accounts uh, talks of Nimrod, but it uses the same, uh, the same picture. And uh, what happened was that uh, Naram Sin, he, he defeated the, uh, uh, 
the Lulibians and he erected the stele of himself and, and the stele was about uh, six foot tall and the stele uh, is, was found and is currently in the Louvre in, in Paris and you can actually have a look at that. You can Google it, put in Naram Sin and stele and Louvre and they'll show you a picture of it there. But there's no doubt when looking at the depiction, it's about six foot high and it has him standing on the tower and he's uh, fighting the enemy that are cowering before him and it pictures him with an a with an arrow in his hand and he's thrusting through these people that are on the on the uh, on the tower and at the top of the tower at the summit there's the sun and the moon next to it so it pictures it pictures this tower rising to the stars to the sun and the moon and uh, that was part of the myth that developed now naram sin was a, was a kishite now unfortunately the the, the Israelites, when they were getting their document uh, together, they called him a Cushite. But there's no doubt that uh, that was a mistake. It should actually be Kishite. And uh, it's Naram Sin depicted on that tower, which they're speaking of. And uh, that uh, gave fuel to this myth that developed. And um, we see the biblical account, uh, Genesis 10 from verse 8, uh, states, it, states as follows. Now, Cush became the father of Nimrod. And he became a mighty one on the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erek, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. And uh, it's, from the land he went forth into Assyria, and built Nineveh, and uh, Rehoboth, Ir, and Kala, and reasoned between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. And then again in, in Genesis 11, uh, it goes on and says from verse 3, Then said uh, to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And, and they used bricks for stone and they used uh, tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into the heaven. And let us make uh, for ourselves a name, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower and where the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they have uh, the same language. And that is uh, what they began to do. And uh, now nothing uh, which they purpose to do will be impossible uh, for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another, one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them uh, abroad from there over the face of the whole earth. And they stopped building the tower. Now we see that this, this is, a, is, a, is an overview of those myths that already uh, were developed with the Sibylline oracles and with Barosus and these various people. So it was a known, uh, known uh, situation. Now, having looked at this, we see that uh, Naramson wasn't a Kushite, he was a Kishite. And they, they got that wrong when they drew the story up. But they were writing the story around about uh, uh, between... Uh, uh, five uh, uh, during the captivity in in the uh, in the sixth uh, century BC, but we see that uh, Naramson lived about two thousand two hundred, so he would have lived um, well over uh, about one thousand six hundred years odd before this time. And now they're piecing this particular story together, but it relates to this um, uh, to this uh, myth that developed and spoke about the languages and the separation. And the reason why these uh, the languages uh, came into it was that um, the myth of this universal flood had developed, and uh, they were stating that all of these languages were, were created out of this incident. But we show that there was never a time that these languages stopped being speaking, uh, stopped being spoken, and um, right through this period when the flood was meant to take place, all of these languages were still in existence and they were the same languages that were spoken for thousands of years before the flood. And uh, they were trying to give a plausible type of explanation how all these languages came into being. And what we're saying is there never was a universal flood. There wasn't a need to actually create this myth. But because it, uh, the, the flood was believed to take such a, a long time uh, previously, in other words, around about uh, 2400 BC or even before this time that uh, they got to a stage, uh, stage where they actually developed this myth to try and give an explanation how these languages came into being. But there were other factors uh, besides the uh, stele 
uh, that uh, Naramson built, and, and he was the one that uh, was uh, the tower was uh, reflected with the sun and the moon. So there's no doubt it's actually speaking of him. Now, in the myths, it, it, it seems to indicate that a whirlwind came and, and, and did damage to the tower. And uh, what, uh, what, uh, what lent uh, also um, to this myth, what, what assisted in, in this myth developing, was after um, Naramsin's uh, demise, a, uh, a, a Curse of a God was a poem that was uh, written, and apparently uh, Naramsin um, uh, spoke poorly of Enlil, and the followers of Enlil developed this Curse of a God, and they said that he would come and cause their temples to shake and its treasures to be scattered uh, due to his rejection of uh, Enlil. So they were believing this to happen. And then we looked at uh, various aspects of this uh, Tower of Babel, and, and, and um, George Smith speaks of, uh, of um, his uh, colleague, uh, Sir Henry Rawlinson, visiting these sites and having a look at them. And he, in, in the book, we give an explanation of this, and, and we quote uh, Sir Henry Rawlinson, and he states that these, uh, these ziggurats, uh, these towers, were built very poorly, and uh, they were about six or seven uh, stories high. And each story was dedita- uh, dedicated to a particular god. And, and of course, they worshipped the, uh, the planets. They saw them as the gods. And each one was a different color relating to the different, uh, different uh, planets. And with time, these, uh, many of these fell over because they, they weren't built in the center of the platform, but more to the back. And it, these collapsed over time. So it also gave uh, substance to these myths that these towers were broken and uh, fell to the uh, fell to the earth. Now they wanted to show how all these uh, languages developed in such a short time, and this is what they were trying to do here. And uh, what also uh, assisted this myth was that the uh, the, the division of uh, languages um, they they developed a map uh, which is dated around about thousand to six hundred six BC, and the map is actually on the cover of the book, uh, the beginnings. And this was developed there in, uh, in Babylon, Mesopotamia. And they showed the area uh, with the mountains in the north and the rivers coming and the different settlements in the different languages, which in a sense gave people a graphic of these various uh, languages. And we looked at, uh, we looked at uh, a, a uh, comments made by Hammurabi. And Hammurabi lived uh, almost the same time as... Uh, as uh, Abraham, uh, 1792 to 70, uh, 1750 BC. And he did a lot of work clearing out the swamps and he relocated people. And there's, uh, there's a, uh, a writing here in the context of Scripture and uh, in the, uh, the second volume. And uh, the title of it is Hammurabi and, 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 and the number given to this particular writing is 2.107b. And it states, I dug the canal Hammurabi Nuhush Nishi. Uh, Hammurabi is the abundance of the people, which brings abundant water to the land of Sumer and Akkad. And I turned both its banks into cultivated areas. Uh, I kept uh, heaping up piles of grain. I provided perpetual water for the land of Sumer and Akkad and gathered the scattered peoples of the land of Sumer and Akkad and provided for them pastures and watering places. In abundance and plenty, I shepherded them and I settled them in peaceful abodes. Now, these peaceful abodes that Hammurabi would have settled these people would have been uh, areas where they all spoke the, uh, the same language. And then what happened with all these elements, they developed this particular myth over the next uh, thousand years odd. And the, and the myth actually was, was developed through this Naram Sin. And it definitely related to Naram Sin. We show that they might have changed his name to Naram Rud, or, uh, which is a lover of, of crushing down or, or lover of, 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 of the victory. Uh, and, and, and his name became Naram Rud, Naram Rod, uh, Nimrod. And, uh, but he definitely was the person, a person with a steely that was reaching the stars. And his tower came crashing down after his fall. And he was definitely a Kishite and not a Kushite. And then the curse of a god that spoke of the gods causing these temples to shake. And then, of course, the wind blew these temples and stopped the work there. And 
uh, and then the collapse of the Adian, Akkadian Empire shortly after Naram Sin, they would have pictured this tower coming to an end and his kingdom crashing down to the ground. And of course, then, of course, as, as uh, George Smith states, that the ziggurats were built poorly and often fell down. And the separation of peoples by language group uh, in the Mesopotamian alluvial system. So all of those, they used that to actually blend this myth. And this myth developed when the Israelites were there in uh, Babylon at that time. So they wanted to show everything that was done from the beginning. And this was part of that perceived history. We show that all of the languages, the, the Sumerian languages and the Egyptian languages, uh, they, they were all adopted and they were speaking those through the 6th, uh, 5th, 4th millennium BC. And there was never a time that these actually uh, these languages stopped. We also show that, that many of the Indo-European languages and the, the origin, origins of the Indo-European language sits as DNA within those languages. And we've shown in the book, and you can see it clearly, that many of these languages have been spoken for 10,000, they were developing 10,000 years before this time and went right through this, per this, uh, this period without these languages changing. And also the Egyptians, their languages went right through that period. And they were trying to accommodate perceived world history, this perceived uh, universal flood which never took place. And we've shown clearly it was a, a flood that um, that was a, a local flood and, and not a universal flood. And the story of, of, of Noah's grandchildren that went out to supposedly resettle all these areas. We've looked at all of those names and there's about 30 or 40 of them and we looked at the origins of those names, the origins. And many of them, like, like for instance, Mitzrayim, we've shown that in, in David Rawls' book, that he shows clearly it, it, the name was M-A-S-R, -M Masr, uh, the followers of, of, of Asher, and, 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 and the plural was Masrim, and that's where the name of Mitzrayim came from. And then we showed that uh, Tarshish was named after the, uh, the, the river that flowed under the walls at Gnosis, and, 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 and it was called Tritro, and it is, uh, the pronunciation in Greek would have been Trishish, and that's where the name of that river came on. And all of these places, Javan and Lud and, um, and the, the uh, Sidon, which, which means fishing, was named after the principal trade of, of Sidon. And, and the name, uh, the name of uh, Sheba to relate it to uh, Saba. Sheba means from Saba and Saba is the gentle breeze. And that would have been the gentle breeze at the oasis of Marib. And we've shown all these things in the book. And there's, there's no ways that, uh, that this uh, universal came and it was resettled with these people. And we show clearly that this, uh, what the Israelites were trying to give, do was trying to give substance to these myths that were uh, developed at the time and that uh, these uh, things never took place. There was never this, uh, uh, this uh, Tower of Babel incident where the languages were, were all separated and people had to go out and establish new nations. All of those languages had been in existence for thousands of years, long before the flood ever took place and continued right through that period. And the, uh, the uh, Indo-European roots of all those languages in the north of, 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 of Thrace, of, of, of Greece, of Anatolia, of Lud, of uh, Tarshish, all those places, all of those languages have got Indo-European roots and would have been built up over the last 10,000 years. So one can see clearly that there was, there was never this universal flood and there was never this Tower of, Tower of Babel. We show much more uh, evidence in the book for that. Uh, so we're going to uh, finish this podcast here. We thank you for watching. These books are available on Amazon.com and uh, BookBaby.com. Just do a search under Ernest Austin Adams. Thank you for watching.